Welcome to Politicking. I'm Larry King. Historian Kevin Cruz is the author of the new book, One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America. In it, he closely examines how a country that was founded on the separation of church and state has seen its political and religious spheres develop such a cozy relationship in recent times. Professor Cruz joins me from Princeton, New Jersey, where he is professor of history. What prompted you to write the book, Professor Cruz? Well, thanks for having me, Larry. Uh, what prompted the book was, uh, my first book was a study of, uh, of grassroots conservatism that really looked at the, the role of race in the making of modern conservatism. And I knew that was only part of the story. Uh, so I wanted to look at uh, what was in the early 2000s when I started writing this project, or doing this project, uh, was another uh, significant trend uh, in modern conservatism. And that was the role of religion. So the Founding Fathers, they didn't come up with this one nation under God? No, far from it. Uh, you know, the Founding Fathers, you know, we, we all know the, the line in the Declaration of Independence that links our rights to a creator. Uh, but the Constitution, which the Founders set up to enumerate uh, and uh, protect those rights, uh, the only reference to God in it is in the date, in the year of our Lord. All the other references to religion are ones that keep uh, the state at arm's length uh, from religion. Uh, there is no... Uh, religious tests for office holders. Uh, there is no establishment of a national religion. There is no uh, uh, interference by Congress allowed uh, with the free exercise of religion. If you look at the Treaty of Tripoli in 1797, a major treaty, uh, one begun by George Washington, uh, signed by John Adams, ratified unanimously by a Senate who was half filled with signers of the Constitution, it says quite clearly uh, that the government of the United States is in no sense founded on the Christian religion, quote unquote. Uh, so they were very clear about this. Yes, they were, uh, as many people have said, a nation of Christians. But on this issue of was the government formerly a Christian nation, uh, they were quite clear, no. Why did they put in God we trust? Well, that was around the Civil War. Why did that go on the coins? Well, that went on the coins actually for that, that very reason. When the, the war broke out, uh, a number of ministers uh, wrote uh, the Treasury Secretary, Salmon Chase, and said the reason we have this uh, civil war, we have brother against brother right now, uh, is because of our founding sin, our original sin. And by that, they meant that the founders had not made the country uh, formally and officially a Christian nation. So they urged the inclusion of a religious motto on coins uh, in order to correct that, that original sin. And Sam and Chase picked, in God we trust for coins. And what about the phrase, under God and the Pledge of Allegiance? That's fairly new, right? Uh, that is, that is. Uh, so the phrase itself uh, gets its origins in the Gettysburg Address, when Lincoln makes a prayer that this nation under God will, will flourish. Uh, but the inclusion of the words under God don't happen until 1954 in the pledge. The, the pledge itself uh, was written by uh, Francis uh, uh, Bellamy, uh, a, uh, a Christian socialist, a Baptist minister. Uh, but he, he writes the pledge without any reference to God. It's only in uh, 1954 that this phrase is finally added uh, to the once secular pledge. Didn't Lincoln once say, if there is a God, I hope he likes us? Yes. <laughs> and, and again, Lincoln and many of the other founders were themselves religious. Uh, uh, Lincoln's speeches uh, are filled with uh, countless references uh, 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 to God, to the Almighty, he often referred to him. Uh, but on this issue of uh, should the government that they, lead, that they led uh, be religious, uh, they were of uh, much more mixed opinions. And Jefferson was a deist, right? That's right. And Patrick, who was the, uh, who was the uh, person who didn't believe in God at all on the founding father? Oh, Tom Paine. Tom Paine, yeah. All right, when did, when did this become your subtitle, How Corporate America Invented Christian America? When did that happen? Well, that really starts in the 1930s, and it starts with uh, uh, corporate America kind of being put back on its heels, uh, in the wake of the great crash, uh, the public is blaming them for the economic miseries. With the rise of the New Deal, uh, they're finding that their businesses are now being regulated by the government uh, uh, to, a, to a stark degree in their eyes. Uh, and most pressingly, uh, the New Deal has empowered labor unions, which are on strike all around them in the 30s. So corporate leaders push back with a massive campaign of public relations. Uh, they, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers uh, increases its PR funds by 20 two times in just three years. They pour millions of dollars into this effort. The problem is that all of their efforts to uh, push back against the New Deal 
uh, on purely economic terms are uh, soundly rejected by the public. Uh, one of these groups uh, uh, is called the American Liberty League, uh, and it's heavily funded by DuPont, General Motors, uh, other corporations. Uh, the problem is that their arguments sound like they're coming directly from DuPont and General Motors and other corporations. <laughs> Jim Farley, the head of the Democratic Party, says uh, they ought to call the American Liberty League the American Cellophane League, because <laughs> number one, it's a DuPont product, and number two, you can see right through it. <laughs> so instead, uh, they realize that they need to make um, a different sort of case for free enterprise. And they look around and they, and they say this in their private letters and their public speeches uh, that the most trusted people in America are ministers. And so if we can get ministers to make this case for us, uh, it'll resonate with the public. And that's exactly what they do. And now we have you bring up the Reverend James uh, Fifield. Is it pronounced Fifield? Fifield, yes. Fifield. He linked capitalism and Christianity? That's exactly right. And he's not, he's not the first to do this. This is an old trend in, uh, in certain uh, uh, corners of, 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 of Christian thinking and capitalist thinking. Uh, but what he does is he pairs them in a way in which they're pitted against the New Deal. Uh, he pioneers uh, what I discuss in the book as Christian libertarianism, uh, this idea that both Christianity and capitalism are essentially individualistic systems in which individuals rise and fall on their own merits. Uh, and so as he tells it, uh, if you're a good uh, Christian, uh, you go to heaven. If you're a, a bad Christian, you go to hell. If you're a good uh, a member of a capitalist society, you make money. If you're a bad one, uh, you go to the poorhouse. And so he says these are linked naturally. And the New Deal state, this regulatory state, this welfare state, uh, is interfering with this natural process. And it is, in fact, he calls a form of pagan statism. So he calls for a return to what he uh, winds up summing up as freedom under God, as opposition to uh, the slavery of the welfare state. And then communism, of course, being atheistic, so it was naturally to make capitalism... Uh, exactly. Right, on the other. But if the word God doesn't mean Christianity, does it? I mean, Jews talk about God, Muslims talk about God. Why is God Christian? Well, the language is always one that is, that is focused on God and not Jesus Christ. So in 1954, there's a, um, a revival of this perennial campaign to have uh, an amendment written into the Constitution that would acknowledge the law and authority of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Uh, that doesn't get very far in the Senate. But that same Senate that shoots that down is the one that quickly embraces under God being added to the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, and embraces in God we trust that year uh, to be placed on stamps for the first time. But why is so that this Christian, is what the, though? The word God, well, a Jew could say in God we trust then say it as nobly as a Christian, right? Well, that's exactly the point. So the, the language is always driven by God. Behind the scenes, there's always a slippage in talking about America being a Christian nation. This is when the idea of a uh, Judeo-Christian tradition is really first taking hold. Eisenhower is key in spreading that ideology. Um, so, the, so Jews and Catholics and Protestants all come together behind this language of one nation under God. Uh, the original drivers of it, though, had, had a Christianity, actually had a pro Protestant Christianity in mind uh, when they advanced that language. It wasn't Catholic, it was, a, it was Protestant. In, in the origins. What Eisenhower does is he, he broadens uh, the appeal of this language. He, he uncouples it from that Christian libertarian origins, and he instead he welcomes in... Democrats and Republicans, conservatives and liberals, Catholics, Jews, as well as Protestants. There are even uh, uh, notes made to, uh, to uh, Mohammedans, or Muslims as we would refer to them today, uh, Buddhists uh, as well. So it's a very capacious language. Uh, it's what U Yale Law School Dean Eugene Rosso calls ceremonial deism, uh, the deism <laughs> because God is always drawn very broadly. Now, when did presidents start saying, God bless America? I don't remember Truman ever saying it. When did presidents start? Was it Reagan? Reagan really pioneers this What about practice. Carter? So was, Carter was a strong Christian. Carter was a strong Christian, but never really closed his speeches with that. There's a, uh, a book called The God Strategy, which, which, which tracks this in, in length. Uh, one, person, one president before Reagan had closed a speech with God Bless America. That was Nixon in 1973. Uh, but he was trying to get his way out of uh, Watergate. It's not a very auspicious uh, beginning. But Reagan starts it in 1980, and from then on it becomes um, almost an expected part of every presidential speech. And we have the National Prayer Breakfast, right? That's right. Okay, now why... That starts under Eisenhower. Why is it bad? Well, I don't think it's necessarily bad. Uh, well, I, your I think, book uh, implies I mean, my point that, of the book right? Is, how Christians... Uh, well, how corporate America invented Christian America? 
That sounds like it's bad. Not bad, uh, a different story than I think what we expect. If you'd asked most Americans, as you noted in your introduction, where One Nation Under God, Where in God We Trust came from, they would assume this came from the founders. Uh, instead, I, as I show in the book, uh, this movement comes about, these changes happen in the mid-50s. They happen all within a relatively short span of time, uh, within many of our own lifetimes. And they happen uh, uh, for a different purpose than we thought. That doesn't mean they're bad. As I say in the, in the conclusion of the book, uh, you know, new traditions uh, can actually mean more to us than ones that we adhere to kind of out of rote repetition. Uh, but I think as an historian, it's my job to, uh, to illuminate the actual history here. All right, for example, why is Christmas, as a Jew, I've often questioned this, why is Christmas a national holiday? Well, uh, again, to go back to the founders, if you look at the pilgrims, the pilgrims didn't celebrate Christmas. Uh, they thought it was a, a, a pagan perversion. Uh, the Puritans uh, had nothing to do with it. Um, I, I don't remember when it actually becomes a, a federal holiday, uh, but it's, it's a sign of, again, this idea that we are, uh, if not a formerly Christian nation uh, uh, during the 19th and early 20th century, we are at least still thought of as a nation of Christians. And so a lot of laws, laws dealing with alcohol, laws dealing with um, uh, family issues are often done in a way in which uh, kind of yield to certain Christian sensibilities. How much of this is right wing in that I know some right wing pundits uh, will often say, don't say season's greetings or happy holidays, say Christmas. Well, that, that m motive is, is certainly one that's driven by the right. Uh, Bill O'Reilly has his perennial warnings about the, the war on Christmas today. Uh, and it's, it's one that starts, that starts in the 60s. Uh, and it does, it starts really with the campaign against um, a school prayer. Uh, people on the right uh, rally in defense of school prayer and then quickly becomes um, a school celebrations of religious holidays becomes a, a pivotal issue there. But they don't celebrate Jewish holidays. In some parts of the country they do, uh, not nationally. But some, some schools certainly take off Jewish holidays. What effect did Billy Graham have on all of this? Billy Graham's a huge figure in this, in this movement. Um, we often don't think of him in these terms, but he was very much part of the, the group of Christian libertarians I talk about in the book. Uh, when he uh, comes onto the national scene in the late 40s and early 50s, uh, it's with a very stark message uh, that uh, in part uh, plays into this uh, attack against the New Deal. Uh, he's strongly supportive of business leaders, uh, so much so that a, a London uh, newspaper columnist starts calling him the big business evangelist. Uh, he's fiercely hostile uh, to the regulatory state and to labor unions. Uh, he tells a, a rally in Greensboro, North Carolina, that the Garden of Eden will be a paradise, uh, where there'll be no union dues, no labor leaders, no snakes, and no disease. Uh, and his early backers are, are major figures uh, uh, in, from corporate America, uh, media figures like William Randolph Hearst, Henry Luce of Time Magazine, uh, the richest man in America, Sid Richardson, uh, an oil man. Uh, is in fact his, uh, his early patron uh, who does a lot to, to, to promote him. Um, so Graham becomes uh, an instant celebrity at age 30. Uh, and within a, a few years, in 1952, uh, he's uh, met uh, Dwight Eisenhower, also supported by Sid Richardson. Uh, in fact, it brought the two together. Uh, and is wor uh, working on uh, speeches for, uh, for Eisenhower's presidential campaign. And then once Eisenhower's in office, uh, he helps uh, deliver an air of... Um, of, uh, of national uh, a piety uh, uh, to the administration. Recent public policy poll reports 57 percent of Republicans favor officially making the United States called a Christian nation. So this is now a political issue? I think it's always been a political issue. I mean, there, there was a brief moment when Eisenhower brought it in where it, uh, it had almost universal acceptance, everyone except for um, Atheists and agnostics were on board with this, uh, but but really from the 60s forward, this this has become a political football. And it's polarizing, isn't it? Absolutely. And again, it's ironic. We, Eisenhower did this because he thought it was the best way to bring Americans together. Uh, and I think for a few years there, he was he was quite right. It really did bring together left and right, again Protestant, Catholics, Jews, uh, all sorts of Americans found common cause around this national religious language. Uh, the problem is, is that as soon as it moved from that vague level of, 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 of a national religion, and again, going back to that idea of a ceremonial deism, these broad phrases that everyone could get behind, and God we trust, one nation under God. Once it moved from that national level down to the local level, uh, uh, particularly in schools, 
uh, it becomes much more divisive and much more polarizing. Because in schools, you can't simply say, we're going to pray a, a broad prayer. Um, um, well, you, you, you could. That doesn't work well for another reason. Uh, but you can't simply say, we're going to read a, a, a whatever Bible you want. They have to pick a particular Bible for that classroom. And so is it the King James Version, the Protestants like? Is it the Catholic Bible? Are you going to read from the New Testament and alienate Jewish students? Uh, on and on there are complications. Uh, and if you do have a vague watered down uh, prayer, uh, like the one that New York State composes, uh, it actually offends people for other reasons. It's because it, it doesn't it have a mention of Jesus Christ. So evangelicals and fundamentalists speak out against that prayer. Uh, Catholics don't like it for one reason. Protestants don't like it for another. So there's really no pleasing all sides when you get down to that local level where this religious uh, experience is, is most often had. One thing would probably be true is we'll never elect an atheist president, right? I think not for the foreseeable, <laughs> foreseeable future, not, not, not by any means. When, when you researched this book, what surprised you? I think what surprised me was the, uh, in the 60s, after that school prayer fight, there's a, a movement for a constitutional amendment to allow school prayer. Uh, and I had assumed, I think naively, that this would play out the way in which you would think it would play out today with um, seculars and atheists and agnostics on one side, maybe civil libertarians too, and then everyone who was religious lined up in support. And what I found was actually the opposition to that school prayer amendment was led by uh, a clergy. Uh, it was led by uh, uh, the heads of, of major uh, Protestant and Jewish faiths, uh, uh, some Catholic voices, because they took their religion seriously, because they didn't want a one-size-fits-all faith. They didn't want what I call in the book a lowest common denomination faith. Uh, if you are Baptist, you want your children raised according to the traditions of, of the Baptist faith. If you're Catholic, you want them raised according to the Catholicism, on and on. And so if you believe in the details that make you a particular sect as opposed to kind of a, a vague, generic Judeo-Christian, if such a thing existed, then you want your children to be taught in those same values. They, didn't want, they also didn't want the state usurping their role. They thought religious instruction was the role of the churches. They didn't want the state getting involved. Uh, what if, they thought that was, that was their job. What effect is the advance of social media, techno technological advances, how has that had an effect on this subject, if at all? Well, I, I think the social media and internet, that's a, that's a good question. I think in some ways it's allowed um, all Americans, and on this subject and on any other subject, to find a small audience that agrees with them already uh, and to bounce messages uh, to, to like-minded people, to, to watch cable channels that are of their own liking, to visit sites on the internet that are of their own liking already. And so it, it comes uh, to, I think, reinforce previously held beliefs. And so on this issue, I think you find um, people on the left, people on the right, or wherever they might be, uh, might find that social media, the internet, is simply uh, reinforcing um, uh, reinforcing their previously held beliefs. Uh, I think what we need to do, um, and what I think I and all uh, uh, scholars hope to do, uh, is, to, is to help provide a point of conversation across uh, those kind of siloed communities. This book will certainly provide it. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Larry. The book is One Nation Under God, How Corporate America Invented Christian America.